Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get into that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel. Thank you for watching my videos. Thank you for commenting on them. And thank you for your support. I really do appreciate it. I just have a few items for the news today. The first one is a podcast by Cheryl Atkinson. I'm not going to play it. It's it's fairly long, like a half an hour. But I'll put the link in the comment in the uh, description of my video. The title of it is "Are the Lawfare Attacks on Donald Trump Falling Apart?" It's a discussion with Tom Fitton, who is the, I believe, the founder and the head of uh, Judicial Watch name escaped me for a second which is a a organization that um, basically their mission is to sue the government for under the freedom of Inf information act to get information that the government doesn't want the public to know and so um, he has extensive experience with lawsuits and understands what's going on with the law. And so Cheryl talks to him about those cases and he discusses each one in some detail. The second that uh, item that I have is titled, We Don't Want Journalism Back. The other day, uh, I featured an article by Matt Taibbi that was um, talked about a op-ed that one of the New York Times people had written and he asked the question, is journalism back? And so Don Server answers it, we don't want journalism back. And I thought this was an interesting article, so I thought I'd share a little bit of it with you. So it goes with the news. Twitter has replaced them all, referring to all the newspapers and the TV channels, by being immediate and allowing all sides to be heard. And that's really true. If you think about it, Twitter was the, the uh, service that broke the news that bin Laden had been captured long before the media had it. Um, so Don goes on to quote, quote a little bit of what Matt Taibbi wrote. He wrote, illiberal journalists have a different philosophy and they have their reasons for it. They are more concerned with group rights than individual rights, which they regard as a bulwark for the privileges of white men. Now think about that for just a minute. If you're not white, you're not supposed to have any individual rights. Is that what we're saying here? <laughs> individual rights are for everyone, aren't they? How, how do you, how can you separate out individual rights for white men only. That doesn't even make sense. But that's the way journalists think. They have seen the principle of free speech used to protect white ring outfits, right wing outfits like Project Veritas and Breitbart News and are uneasy with it. Yeah, they're uneasy with the First Amendment. They don't like anyone who has an opinion different from theirs. They had their suspicions of their fellow citizens' judgment confirmed by Trump's election and do not believe readers can be trusted with potentially dangerous ideas or facts. Are we going back to the 1300s now, to the Dark Ages? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, that's what it sounds like they want. They are not out to achieve social justice as the knock-on effect of pursuing truth, they want to pursue it head on. The term objectivity to them is code for ignoring the poor and weak and cozying up to the power, as journalists often have done. Journalists abandon objectivity, throwing that precious shield from charges of bias out to spite Donald Trump. People outside of its hardcore readers have found new sources of information, largely, largely through Twitter. Journalists can throw temper tantrums on the floor about misinformation all they want, but after the media promoted the fake COVID vaccine and ridiculous masks, most people no longer believe them, nor should they. <laughs> you know, 
I always get, it always cracks me up a little bit when, when they talk about how journalism is suddenly, uh, bi- un, is suddenly biased now. Like they weren't biased before. Um, look up Walter Durante on Wikipedia. He got a Pulitzer Prize for writing about Russia in the New York Times, and he painted a rosy, rosy picture of Russia while they were killing 20 million of their own citizens. The press has been lying for long before I came on the scene, and I'm 76 years old. So what does that tell you? They have never been unbiased. So then Don writes, thus the answer to Aibi's question, is journalism back, is no. Journalists abandon objectivity. Readers have decided that they do not want the journalists back. And I believe that's probably true. I think people are, you know, not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people are just done with journalism. They're sick and tired of the lies. And so they've moved on to other sources for their information. This next article I have is How Motherhood Liberated Me. And I thought it was very interesting. This woman talks about how when she had her baby, she had all sorts of problems and and she just felt um, like her purpose was gone. She had worked hard as a young woman to create an image for herself that made her seem uh, really successful and really beautiful and all of a sudden it, in her mind it was falling apart because she had a baby so the the article reads here we envision ourselves as market, marketable objects writes sociologist joseph e davis in his 2003 article the Com- commodification of self he describes the way we sell ourselves To be successful at Me, Inc., my traits, values, beliefs, and so on must be self-consciously adopted or discarded, emphasized or de-emphasized. The market has its own ideas of value, and it demands we pitch ourselves as unique and irreplaceable. You'll be the best student. You'll be the best woman for the job. The person sitting across the table should fall in love with you and no one else. While you're doing this, it's easy to develop a prejudice against what we have in common. The skills that everyone is capable of aren't as important as those that are rare. I knew that providing my baby with milk was the most useful, necessary thing I've ever done in my life, but it made me feel the opposite of extraordinary. That is, until my daughter turned six weeks old, and she did something that changed my world forever. She smiled at me. That just got me. I I remember our baby's smiles. New babies, you know, newborn babies and the first uh, 18 months of their lives are just the most precious things. And they can grab your heart in an instant. But there's something about this story that, that troubled me. And that is... Um, her writing at the beginning that, and I didn't read this part to you, but her writing at the beginning about how she had worked hard to create an image of herself. Well, you know, there's something wrong with the world where we're not teaching people that they are unique and that they are worthy as they are without any accoutrements, without any uh, additional pieces added on, without trying to present an image to the world that isn't really you. There's just something seriously wrong with that. Um, I have often said, and I'm not going to tell you the precise words I use because it's kind of disgusting, but I've often said, and my wife doesn't like me saying it, Uh, but I've often said that uh, if you do something in public that you do in private, 
And then when, so, when you think someone is looking at you, you stop doing it, you're way too conscious of other people. And you're way too uncomfortable with yourself. If, if you're making decisions in your life based upon what you think other people think of you, your, your mind is gone in the wrong place. You're, you're not thinking clearly. The decisions you make in your life should be for you. If, if you're always worried about what the neighbors think, then you're not even living your own life anymore. You're living the life you think the neighbors think. And the neighbors don't even think that. You'd be shocked to know the number of times that someone looks at you in public and doesn't even see you. And yet when you see them looking at you, you think, oh my God, what did I do wrong? What, 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 is something out of place? You see how silly that is? Just be yourself. Be that wonderful, unique, beautiful creature that God, that God created. And don't worry about what other people think of you. Just be yourself. Look at my channel. <clears throat> I've grown from September to now. I have over 10,000 subscribers. Why? Because I just, I am myself. I don't put on airs. I don't try to impress people. I've said more than once, I never thought I'd have one person watching my channel. And so I don't, I don't care if you watch or not. I don't care if you're subscribed or not. Not that I don't. Not that I'm not blessed by it. I'm I'm incredibly blessed by it. But frankly, it makes no difference to me if you come to my channel or not. I'm still going to be me. That's who I am. And if a lot of people like who I am, well, so what? That's good. I'm glad you do, and I'm glad you enjoy coming to my channel. I really am. But I'm not going to put on airs for you or for anybody else. I'm not going to try to do something what I can't even think of what it would be but something impressive to make you come here that just seems so so wrong to me it seems so silly so uh I'm getting way off the track here that was my thoughts on that one and this last one that I want to I want to uh, listen to a little bit part of this because um this is an interview that T Tucker Carlson did um, with a man, excuse me, n man named Molson Hart. Uh, Molson Hart is a, um, he, he has a business and he sells stuff on Amazon. And so, uh, I learned something about Amazon that I, I was completely unaware of, and it's very disturbing. And I thought you might want to know about it too. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch Tucker Carlson talking about Amazon and interviewing Molson Hart. Just a little bit of it. Just so easy. But what exactly does Amazon.com do? How did Jeff Bezos get so rich? The details are unknown to most people, even frequent users of the site. Well, a new documentary takes a closer look at what Amazon does at its business practices and what those practices do to the people who try to make a living selling their products on the site. The documentary is called Amazon Market Power Monopoly. So the filmmakers interview Amazon sellers who say they are barely keeping their heads above water because of the company's policies. And those policies tell them exactly how much they can charge for their own products. So take a look at this clip from the movie. It shows a German businessman who makes and sells children's beds and does nearly all of his business on Amazon.com. He says the company puts pressure on him to keep his prices low, as low as possible, to keep customers from buying that same product on another site such as eBay. If Amazon finds out that he's selling his products cheaper on another site like eBay, they will punish him by making his products very hard to find on Amazon. And they do this by taking away what is called his buy box. The buy box is the area you click on the product page to make a purchase. If 
there's no buy box, customers tend to leave and buy it somewhere else. That sounds confusing. Watch the man demonstrate exactly how this is done. His most important online shop window at Amazon, the so-called buy box, the framed box around the shopping cart field. So this whole box here that's just called the buy box, and you can see the add to cart button here. And if I click on it now, then I have this in the shopping cart and I can buy the item. But Marco Schock can also lose the buy box for his bids. For example, if his prices are not competitive. That means for me, with buy box, I can sell. Without buy box, 95 to 99 percent of the sales are gone. Who gets the buy box is decided by Amazon alone. Marco Schock shows us. I'm going to change the price to 349 euros. And we will see that in about 15 minutes, the buy box here is gone. And indeed, after 15 minutes, the buy box has disappeared. For customers, it now seems as if the item is not available at the moment. In other words, Amazon decides what you charge for your products, and if you don't obey, they will shut you down, but in the most passive-aggressive corporate way. They just remove your buy box. It's fascinating, and there's a lot like that in this film. It goes on to follow the business of a man called Molson Hart. He's the CEO of an educational toy company that does most of its business on Amazon. The film crew was there when Hart learned that Amazon would once again raise its fees on him. So in order to turn a profit, he was forced to jack his prices. Watch. We are probably going to have to raise prices. Why? What's going on? So uh, what they, what Amazon did is they uh, increased all the fulfillment fees by about 5%. So um, if you look over here, uh, we got an email. Uh, shipping brain place is going to be 5% more expensive. Now... The Texan has to recalculate. In order to keep our profits at the same level, we're going to have to raise the price by, you know, 50 cents. So maybe we're going to go to 17.99, um, up from 16.99. And the problem: if he increases on Amazon, he must also increase the prices of his products on eBay, Walmart, and even in his own web store. Although they are not affected by the fee increase, if he doesn't do that, experience shows that he loses the buy box on Amazon. Oh, so it's not really a free market tactic. If they're forcing you to raise your prices on other platforms, it's a monopoly tactic. And there's a difference. That's not the free market you just saw. That's how monopolies operate. Molson Hart knows that very well. He's lived it. He's the man you just saw in that clip, and he joins us now. Molson Hart, thanks for joining us. The clip we just played is a fair representation of your life as an Amazon seller. Yeah, that's absolutely a fair representation of our life as an Amazon seller. Um, if your products are cheaper off Amazon than they are on Amazon, then you lose all your sales on Amazon, which is a big problem for us because 90% of our sales come from Amazon. So what you're saying, I think, is that Amazon sets the price market wide, not just on its own site, but on other sites. So that's, is, is that correct? In a way, that's true, right? So if you look at the statistics, and a lot of people have a different st statistics out there, the Amazon controls roughly 50% of the whole online e-commerce market, depending on how you calculate it. And for us, since 90% of our sales come from Amazon, and since Amazon is more expensive to sell on than other platforms like eBay, Walmart, or even our own website, Amazon, in a way, kind of does set the price because if we price our products lower off of Amazon, because those um, those off Amazon platforms are cheaper than Amazon, we lose 90% of our sales on Amazon. So we have to constantly keep our prices up off Amazon, and we can't we can't lower our prices on Amazon to the costs off Amazon because then we'll end up losing money because Amazon is more expensive to sell on than it is to sell on ah, off Amazon. It's fascinating. Thanks for watching the episode with Molson Hart. It gives you a sense of what Amazon is really like, worse than you thought. So if you don't want to use Amazon, and up till now you haven't had much of a choice because it's effectively a monopoly, well, now you don't have to because there's an option. A new service made for you, it's called Public Square. 
and they're building a brand new way of conducting commerce, selling and buying that goes back to America's roots. So far, they have over 75,000 small businesses from this country offering their products and services. So if you're a small business owner hoping to sell handcrafted goods, guns, ammo, fresh food, household essentials, whatever, Public Square is perfect for you. It's a great place to do that, to sell what you make. And it's also a great place to buy what other people make. And it's easy. You can add your business in less than 10 minutes for free and sell your products nationwide. To learn more, go to public square slash Tucker. They're a sponsor of this program and we're happy to have them. Proud, in fact. So if I can just ask a stupid question, how does Amazon know what you're doing off Amazon? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think they do it two different ways. The primary way they do it is basically by using an algorithm that just like scrapes the entire internet, looking at prices on Walmart, looking at prices on eBay. And in, in the video that you showed in the documentary, that's how uh, Amazon was able to shut down that person's product so fast within 15 minutes. So the algorithm is kind of like monitoring the whole internet to see if prices are higher or lower on and off Amazon. And it, it might also be possible for, there used to be like a button on pages on Amazon where consumers could report like a better price elsewhere. So there might be like a, a human component as well, but it's mainly just an algorithm where they're watching prices on and off Amazon. But they know when you've been sleeping, they know when you're awake. I mean, this, <laughs> I mean it's like a, they're part of the surveillance data. I mean, you wouldn't imagine because you're selling on Amazon that Amazon would be watching your behavior in other places, right? So you can watch the rest of that yourself. But were you aware of that? I was not. It blows my mind. It's there. There's something really evil about that. And, you know, my wife says Amazon is the best website that she ever uses for shopping because it's so well designed. But good design doesn't make up for bad business practices, does it? I know one thing. I'm going to be checking out Public Square and see what they have available. And maybe we'll start buying from them instead of Amazon. Uh, what a world we live in, huh? You know that I pray for you. I pray that you will have an abundant life that you will be healthy, that you'll live a long time, and that God will s keep you safe from harm. I pray that he will do the same thing for every person that you love. But I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam era vet out.